Good afternoon, and welcome to the final Office of Disease Prevention Medicine Mind the Gap Lecture for 2013. We've had a full year and look forward to an, another exciting year ahead. The Medicine Mind the Gap Seminar Series explores issues at the intersection of research, evidence, and clinical practice, areas in which conventional wisdom may be contradicted by recent evidence from the role of advocacy organizations in medical research and policy to the importance of behavioral interventions. The Office of Disease Prevention hopes to engage the National Institutes of Health community in thought-provoking discussions to challenge what we think we know and to think critically about our role in today's research environment. Before we begin, I have some housekeeping items. To participate by Twitter, follow us at NIH Prevents and submit questions using the hashtag NIHMTG. You may also email questions to prevention at mail.nih.gov. At the conclusion of today's talk, we will open the floor to questions that have been submitted via Twitter and email. Now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. David M. Murray, the Associate Director for Disease Prevention and Director of the Office of Disease Prevention. Uh, thank you, Paris. Uh, it's my uh, very great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker today. Uh, William Shaddish uh, is a distinguished professor and founding faculty member at the University of California, Merced. He received his bachelor's degree in sociology from Santa Clara University in 1972. His master's and PhD degrees from Purdue University in clinical psychology, 75 and 78. And he had minors in both statistics and measurement. He completed a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in methodology and evaluation research at Northwestern University and joined the faculty at the University of Memphis in 1981. Uh, he left in uh, 2003 to join uh, the faculty at the University of California, Merced. He is the lead author on the now classic text, Experimental and Quasi-Experimental Designs for Generalized Causal Inference. Uh, he is the winner of the Paul Lazarsfeld Award for Evaluation Theory from the American Evaluation Association, the Donald Campbell Award for Innovations in Methodology from the Policy Studies Organization, and the Frederick Mosteller Award for Lifetime Contributions to Systematic Reviews from the Campbell Collaboration. His research interests include experimental and quasi-experimental design, the empirical study of methodological issues, and the methodology and practice of meta-analysis. Uh, as far as the presentation today, I would note that the clinical trial has been the gold standard in bio biomedical research for decades. But as we seek to evaluate more and more complex and often multi-level interventions, some have argued that quasi-experimental approaches may be helpful. Others have countered that quasi-experimental methods cannot provide the same level of rigor as clinical trials. Recent years have seen important advances in the design and analysis, both for randomized experiments and quasi-experiments. A particular focus has been empirical tests of the conditions under which non-randomized experiments can approximate answers from a randomized experiment. Such efforts have a long history in fields such as medicine, psychology, and economics. Recent work is prompted by factors such as evidence-based practice and theoretical advances uh, such as Rubin's causal model. Today's seminar will review illustrative studies that demonstrate the direction such work is taking and the results that seem to be emerging in regards to non-randomized control group designs, regression discontinuity designs, and interrupted time series designs. Dr. Shaddish is going to speak to us today on strengths and weaknesses of experimental and quasi-experimental designs. Dr. Shaddish. All right, everybody, I hope, can now see the title page. Um, and uh, David's already read my title, so I'll move on to the first slide. Um, as David mentioned, uh, randomized experiments really are the gold standard uh, for testing the effects of an intervention for lots of very, very good reasons. Uh, not that they're perfect by any means, but they yield effect estimates that are unbiased and efficient and consistent. Uh, and those are qualities it's uh, not always uh, possible to achieve in any other way. Uh, the problem, of course, is that we cannot always do a randomized trial. Um, so I, I do want to make a comment uh, from the start. Uh, uh, I am a huge fan of randomized trials. Uh, and I, I'm a pretty firm believer that if you can do a randomized trial, uh, 
that it's a very good idea to do that randomized trial unless you've got some very good reasons for not doing it. And those very good reasons are that they're sometimes not feasible and sometimes they're not ethical. And given then that we have to do non-randomized experiments as part of our repertoire, the question is, what are the conditions under which non-randomized experiments can give us answers that might approximate the answers from a randomized experiment? When I talk about non-randomized experiments, there are, I think, three major classes of them. Ordinary non-equivalent control group designs, regression discontinuity designs, and interrupted time series designs. And so I will structure my talk today around each of those three designs one at a time. For, I would say, maybe getting close to 20 years now, I have been interested in what I call the empirical program of quasi-experimentation. Anybody who has read classic works like Cook and Campbell or Campbell and Stanley know that you can get lots of advice about how to do a quasi-experiment. But if you go back and you look at books like that, the advice, while exceptionally sensible most of the time, isn't really based on empirical data. And so for the last 20 years, I have been interested in what we are now calling within-study comparisons to gather empirical data on this question of when can a non-randomized experiment approximate a randomized experiment. And there are many, many versions of this within-study comparison paradigm, if you will. For example, we classify some of them as having four arms and some of them as having three arms. I'll show you examples of those. And each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages. They go back in history at least to Lalonde, who's an economist in 1986. And what he did was he took a well-known randomized experiment in job training. And he pulled out the randomized control group and replaced it with a non-randomized control and then looked to see whether he could use Heckman-type selection bias adjustments to get back to the right answer. And he could not. And that led to some interesting historical events within economics that aren't the purview of my talk today. So I am not the only one doing this by any means. In particular, the research group that I like to think I belong to, Tom Cook, Peter Steiner, these are folks who are at various universities. But we all get together from time to time and we talk about this program of research and how we can foster it. It's a mixture of laboratory analog and field studies. My purpose today is to illustrate and summarize the findings rather than to go into any of the findings in detail. At the bottom of each slide, I will reference the publications where the details are available and I'm delighted to mail those to anybody who emails me and asks for them. So in 2008, we published an article where we said, if we're going to have this program of within-study comparisons, there ought to be some criteria for when a within-study criterion is a good one. And we came up with six. We're constantly modifying these six and working on how to operationalize them better. But this is a good summary. If you want to get a good answer to that question of the conditions under which you get a good answer out of non-randomized experiments, then the randomized trial that you're comparing to should be a good randomized trial. It shouldn't be full of attrition, for example. The quasi-experiment should also be a reasonable exemplar of its class. What's the point of comparing a poor quasi-experiment to a poor randomized experiment? They ought to estimate the same causal quantity. If you know anything about regression discontinuity designs, for example, 
you know that they estimate a slightly different causal quantity than a randomized experiment. Uh, they estimate the effective treatment at the cutoff rather than the average effective treatment. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but if you want to compare them, you have to compare on the same estimate. Um, that there um, ought to be minimal confounds between the randomized experiment and the quasi-experiment other than assignment itself, and that's very hard to achieve. Easy to achieve in a laboratory setting, hard in a field setting. Um, the analysts should be masked to each other's results so that the person analyzing the non-randomized experiment should have no idea what the answer is from the randomized experiment. And then finally, the criteria for judging whether the two results are the same uh, should be clear. That's the hardest one, and we are still working on operationalizing that. And I'll show you examples of it as we go through. Um, so let's start with the non-randomized uh, control group designs, non-equivalent control group. Uh, you have a treatment group and a non-random control that's often formed by some means like self-selection into conditions or a provider or an administrator select people into conditions or some combination of all of those things. And so the first example uh, that I'm going to give you is what we would call a forearm study, and you'll see why in a second, um, where the non-randomized experiment uses self-selection. Uh, this um, uh, study was published in the Journal of the American Statistical Association in 2008. Um, uh, this was a laboratory analog study. Uh, we had a large number of uh, undergraduate psychology students who were randomly assigned to be in a randomized experiment or a non-randomized experiment. Uh, in the randomized experiment, they got randomly assigned to either mathematics training or vocabulary training. And in the non-randomized experiment, they got to choose which condition. And if you look at the sample sizes for the non-randomized part, you'll notice that uh, almost twice as many chose vocabulary, uh, and the reason is uh, we, we have some evidence on this that I'll talk about. Um, uh, they hate math, um, and they do anything to avoid taking math training. Um, uh, the basic findings that we got out of uh, this study uh, um, were that the adjusted non-randomized findings closely ap approximated the results from the randomized uh, uh, study. Um, and I'll elaborate that a little bit. Um, first, the method of adjustment really didn't matter. Uh, that was a little bit of a surprise to me. At the time, I was just getting into propensity scores, and I thought, you know, wow, this is the hot thing, and it's going to make a big difference. It didn't matter. Um, we tried propensity score stratification, weighting, covariance, um, ordinary regression, um, uh, where you didn't have a propensity score. You just took your covariates and you threw them in a regression equation. We tried structural equation modeling. And we were always able to get back to the right answer. Um, here's what did matter. Uh, and I think this is the important lesson here having good pretest measures. And I'm going to elaborate that on the next slide. But I want to comment that um, this should not be surprising to anybody who knows something like Rubin's causal model, um, uh, which depends crucially on something called the strong ignorability assumption. Uh, and that is that uh, uh, potential outcomes are independent of assignment to conditions given a set of covariates X. And that assumption, unfortunately, has no test, so we can never know for certain whether or not we've met that assumption, um, but it's crucial. Let me elaborate here. Um, we had 25 covariates predicting treatment selection. But we didn't just pick those covariates out of an archive or available data or something like that. We did um, a systematic study of the selection process itself prior to running the full study. 
we did a pilot study that had, if I recall correctly, about 150 people in it. So it wasn't a small study itself. And then we, of course, piloted our procedures, but we also asked people why they chose the conditions uh, that they chose. Um, we also interviewed uh, key informants. So we went to college counselors and we said, uh, you know, what makes a, a student sign up for a math class or things like that? We reviewed the literature, which had actually virtually nothing. You'll find very few people actually study the selection process. Uh, or if they do, they sure don't publish it. Uh, and then, of course, we use common sense. Uh, if you teach at a college level, you know that some students are just plain math phobic. Uh, and uh, so you'd want to measure that. So then we developed uh, measures of that selection process um, for the full-blown study. Now, first thing I want to ask is how many non-randomized experiments that you know and how many propensity score analysis studies that you know um, devote that kind of attention to careful measurement of the selection process. I think it's extremely rare. Um, we did work, and the references are at the bottom of the slide, demonstrating um, uh, that having covariates that accurately predict the selection process is the key. Um, and as an aside, we also demonstrated something that most people don't look at, and that is the reliability of measurement is important here, uh, that your uh, bias adjustment improves the more reliable your measures are. Um, I, I think another feature of this study that I'd introduce um, is the importance of a good control group. Uh, we've been Work, well, first of all, we randomly assign people out of the same introductory psychology subject pool. Um, so you've got people from the same university in the same class, roughly the same age, um, probably from similar socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, et cetera. Um, so we started off with a lot of similarities between the people in the randomized experiment and the people in the non-randomized experiment. Um, we've come to call this uh, focal local control. We stole that phrase from Don Campbell. Uh, he used it in a time series uh, context. Local meaning from the same location and focal meaning uh, sharing the same substantive characteristics. Um, and we have uh, another study, example three in a moment, uh, where we will elaborate that a little bit for you. Um, but the notion is, using good design by selection, selecting a good control group before you do the study to reduce the amount of bias that the analysis has to remove. Uh, our 2008 article reviewed a number of other studies that seem to support this idea. Um, nonetheless, it's a little hard to operationalize. We are working on operationalizing it better, and uh, I'll talk about that more in example. Three. Uh, example two will be very brief. Um, uh, all of this uh, in example one was independently replicated by a uh, young faculty member in Germany, Steffi Pohl. Uh, the um, replication wasn't an exact replication. It was done in Germany, so uh, the vocabulary condition was a little bit different. Uh, the initial biases were higher than in our uh, study, but in general, the results were exactly the same, gratifyingly so. Um, there was no difference in analytic method. They all could recover the answer well. Um, and uh, uh, proper covariate, uh, good covariate selection uh, and reliable covariates is what made the difference. I remember when I first saw her present that data, uh, I was just thrilled that it replicated Pretty much 100%. All right. Um, example number three. Um, uh, Stuart and Rubin coined a phrase. They called it the hybrid selection model. And it's very, very similar um, uh, to our focal local idea. Uh, and the notion is that 
getting controls that are from the same location with the same substantive characteristics is the ideal, but you can't always get a good substantive match from local controls. So what do you do? Um, well, first thing you do is look for those local controls. And the presumption is that local controls are going to share a great deal of contextual factors um, that are difficult to even recognize uh, uh, or measure. Um, but to define a caliber uh, for your matching process, for example, uh, where you will say within that caliber on substantive uh, characteristics, uh, we will select a local control if we can get a good match within that calendar on sub uh, caliber on substantive characteristics. But when you can't find a match within the caliber locally, then you match outside uh, the locality. Um, and so uh, uh, Holberg, Wang, and Cook, much of this comes from uh, Kelly Holberg's dissertation, which is actually just finishing up, uh, uh, over, finished up over the summer and is in the publication process right now. Uh, so she did a within-study comparison, starting with a randomized trial uh, from Indiana's Diagnostic Assessment Intervention, uh, which um, aimed to affect uh, student academic performance. And she did much like what Lalonde did in that first historical study in 86, substituted a non-randomized matched control for the randomized control. Um, and hence you can see that unlike example one, which we called the four-arm study because it ended up with four groups, uh, this one we would call a three-arm study. Uh, there's a randomized treatment group, a ra randomized control, and a non-randomized control. Uh, and the matches were formed um, local only, even if a good focal match within that caliper on substit, uh, substantive characteristics could not be found, matched on covariates only, ignoring location. So put it differently, uh, th that first one is a focal, uh, a local control only. The second is a focal control or only. And then the third one is the hybrid match procedure that Stewart and uh, Rubin suggested described above. Um, and um, here are the results where the benchmark randomized experiment is the black line down the center uh, uh, at zero uh, there. Um, there were uh, two outcomes uh, at the bottom of the graph there, you'll see one was a math outcome and the other was an uh, English language learning outcome. And the four lines that you see horizontally are the unadjusted quasi-experimental results. Um, and then um, the results adjusted here only for uh, matching. Uh, and the match would, in line two, be only a local match and in line three, only a focal match. And in line four, it used the hybrid match procedure that um, uh, Stuart and Rubin uh, suggested. Um, uh, and uh, you'll notice, by the way, that uh, the units on the horizontal axis there uh, are uh, standard deviation units relative to the randomized experiment. Um, and you'll notice that the um, unadjusted results were about a third of a standard deviation uh, away from the randomized results. Uh, and using the hybrid match procedure brought that difference down to uh, virtually zero for math and about uh, a tenth of a standard deviation for uh, English, English language learning. Um, and it, you know, there's a small um, uh, case to be made here that the hybrid match procedure probably worked best. Uh, example four, um, the role of pretests. Uh, now, when I use the word pretest, I'm not talking about every single covariate that somebody happened to measure before treatment. Instead, I'm talking about uh, those pretest measures that are exactly the same as the outcome measure or are proxies for that outcome measure uh, or may perhaps be age adjusted 
uh, outcome measures. So for example, if your pretest, the child is in third grade and a post-test there in sixth grade, you may need a different reading test uh, that's age adjusted for them. But they're both uh, reading tests. Um, now, pretests are of particular interest because um, it's thought, at least hypothesized, if you go back and look at a lot of design texts, including our own, we'll say it's a good thing to have a pretest. But where's the data to actually support that? The notion here is that um, if you have a pretest on the post test, there's an increased likelihood uh, that that variable will be related to both treatment and outcome, uh, selection into treatment and outcome, and therefore be a good covariate. So uh, another one of the studies Kelly did for her dissertation um, looked at this in three within study comparisons. One was a reanalysis of the data from example one that I gave you, the JAS study. Uh, the second was the Indiana study in the third example I showed you. And the third is the Hong and Raudenbush study of school retention. Um, and the results um, uh, are, I try to summarize the results for you in the pros on the right there. Uh, pretest by themselves, that would be the first line is no covariates at all. Um, the second line is that you have one pretest. And the third line is you have two or more pretest measures of the same outcome construct. The fourth line is every single covariate. Uh, for example, in example one, we have 25 covariates. And then the last line is every single covariate minus the pretests. Um, and if we summarize the results, we'd say pretests by themselves do better than no covariates at all, but they don't do as well as a full set of covariates that includes the pretest. Um, those outliers that you see on the right there, uh, they're particularly interesting because remember the presumption was that pretests are likely to be related to um, selection into conditions and to outcome. And in that case, um, those three outliers, it's clear that was not the case. And that was the JASA study. Um, and uh, that was uh, that the math pretest was not related to selection into the math conditions. Uh, there were different factors entirely that accounted for why people chose math. I alluded or, or avoided math. I alluded to some of those earlier. Um, all right. And then the third comment says that the full set of covariates seems to do best. Uh, pulling out the pretest is not terribly helpful here. Um, for vocabulary training, uh, the, that was the math results for vocabulary training. All three of the studies had both outcomes. Uh, the pretest seemed to do a bit better in this case, but again, the full set of covariates uh, still seems to do best. Um, so what conclusions might we draw from this example? Um, first, uh, pretests have never increased bias. Uh, now, you might be surprised that anybody might even say that they would increase bias. Well, if you know Judea Pearl's work um, uh, has become very popular recently, he has a notion uh, in his theory of a variable that is a collider. Uh, he calls, he's got his own special vocabulary that he uses. Um, uh, and uh, pretests could in fact be colliders. Colliders have the undesirable property that they can increase bias when you uh, adjust for them. Well, in everything that we've done so far, pretests have never done that. I think the conditions under which colliders um, would uh, cause bias um, are actually pretty rare in actual practice. Um, second, I might conclude that um, one pretest by itself, it is capable of reducing all bias um, if you went back and you looked at some of those graphs I showed you, in fact, that can happen. But it does not always do so. It can't be counted on to do so because it needs to be highly correlated with selection. Uh, and the example of the math pretest not being correlated with selection shows that you just can't count on that being the case. Um, two pretests over time can be particularly useful 
if you have selection maturation differences that are occurring or if measurement reliability is modest. And there are some side studies we've done in, um, uh, that are in Kelly's work that can show you that. Um, but the bottom line here is perhaps in design text, we privileged pretests a little bit too much. Um, uh, there are no substitute for good measurement of the selection process into conditions. All right, example five um, has to do with a study on multi-level matching. Um, uh, in uh, the opening remarks, David uh, referred a little bit to um, uh, multi-level studies that are done in complex situations. Uh, students nested within classrooms, patients nested within physician practices, for example. And the question arises, how to match here? Should you match on school level characteristics? Uh, should you match on student characteristics or both? Um, uh, all of us would probably have our own advice on that, but what does some data say about that? Uh, here, the data came from the Indiana study that we used in examples three and four, um, and also from a study called PCEL in Florida, Promoting Science Among English Language Learners. Uh, that study had uh, 64 um, elementary schools that were randomly assigned either to the PCEL program or to treatment as usual. Um, and then the non equivalent control groups. Um, could potentially be drawn from the 824 schools in Florida that were not part of the P-cell experiment. Uh, and this is another example of a three-arm study where you can substitute a non-experimental non control, non-equivalent control group for the randomized control group and see if you can get back to the right answer. Uh, here's the results uh, for math. Um, just matching on the school variables sometimes did well any version of matching on both student and school variables always did well. Uh, and just matching on student variables did not do so well. And for vocabulary uh, outcomes, uh, the matching methods that did the best always used more data. Um, so for example, if you look at the difference between the second line and the third line, it says a one school match or a four, four school match. What that means is um, uh, you have a treatment school, do you select just one control school uh, or uh, do you match to four matching control schools? Well, the data that used the four always tended to do better than the data that did uh, the best. Uh, also, full multi-level matching on all sets of characteristics always did well. But the most important thing, I think, uh, not necessarily obvious from this graph, but present in the write-up of it, um, the best performing matches were always those that improved covariance balance the most. If you know propensity score analysis at all, you know that getting covariate balance is um, a desirable feature uh, of the analysis. Um, and so the bottom line is you have to play with these methods in order to find the one that uh, creates the best covariate balance. So if we did a quick summary for the non-equivalent control group design, um, lesson number one, and I think heads and shoulders, the most important lesson, do your homework on the selection process and measure it reliably. Um, I have a, a, a publication came out earlier this year called Propensity Scores, Promise, Reality, and Irrational Exuberance. Um, and um, the, it, there's a graph that I did a little Google search on propensity scores, uh, and you can see this truly exponential increase in the last 10 years uh, in the use of propensity scores, or at least reference to that term. And then I did a similar search on strong ignorability. And it's almost never mentioned, almost never mentioned. Um, I think there's an awful lot of non-equivalent comparison group designs out there that just use 
available covariance without any study or thought about whether they are related to the selection process. So I've gone on for quite a while on that first bullet point, but I think that's the biggest take home point. It never hurts and it often helps to add a pretest on the post test. Um, if possible, use a focal local control group. And if that's not possible, then use Stuart and Rubin's hybrid matching model. And when you are using nested data, match at both the aggregate and unit level, but um, check a lot of those models to find the one that has the best balance because that's going to do the best job for you. All right, now let's switch to the regression discontinuity design. Um, this is a, not as a well-known a design as the randomized experiment. Assignment to treatment is based on a cutoff score on a measured pretest variable. A common sense example would be all children are administered a reading test, and those who fall below a certain level um, uh, are given remedial, a remedial reading program and the others are not. It was invented in 1960, but not widely used until the mid-90s when economists found it, and they are using it extensively today. Um, there are statistical proofs that it can yield an unbiased and consistent estimate, but it has less statistical power, a lot less statistical power, and more assumptions uh, than the randomized experiment does. Uh, does it work in practice? Uh, there is a lot of evidence today that suggests that, uh, yes, it does work in practice. Um, uh, I'm going to show you one study. This is um, very much like example number one. It's another forearm study, uh, another undergraduate laboratory analog study where we randomly assigned uh, students to be in a randomized experiment with math or vocabulary training or regression discontinuity design where we took their vocabulary scores and we um, set a cutoff and those who fell below a certain level got the vocabulary training and those above a level, uh, that level got mathematics training. Uh, you will notice that the sample size in the regression discontinuity design is about twice as big as it is in the randomized experiment and that is to try to compensate for the lower power of the regression discontinuity design. Um, what's crucial here is the analysis. Um, unbiased estimates only result if the shape of the relationship between the assignment variable and the outcome variable is properly modeled. How do you do that? Well, there are generally three options. Um, uh, when this design was first invented, uh, and up until the economists got a hold of it, um, people used ordinary parametric regression. And the notion was to keep adding polynomials or interaction terms between treatment and polynomial terms um, until they were non-significant and uh, then stop adding them. Uh, and the hope would be that you would uh, uh, recover the appropriate functional form that way. But the problem with that is that you really never know which polynomials to add or when to stop. Uh, as an aside, I'm doing some work right now um, uh, with longitudinal data where the appropriate polynomial is probably a seventh order polynomial. Um, well, nobody would have thought to use ordinary regression with a seventh order polynomial in it. Um, so you really can't count on that parametric regression approach. Um, you can use either non-parametric or semi-parametric methods that allow the data to inform the functional form uh, of the relationship between the two variables. Uh, I tend to use semi-parametric regression. Uh, the difference is largely that semi-parametric regression, uh, unlike non-parametric regression, allows you to have uh, parametric terms or covariates in the model in addition to the non-parametric uh, uh, terms. And the non-parametric terms are used, uh, most of us uh, have uh, heard of something called a low-S smoother, 
Um, well, uh, uh, parametric, uh, semi-parametric regression, non-parametric regressions, they use smoothers. They're more sophisticated smoothers statistically than a low-S smoother, uh, but that's the general idea uh, behind them. Um, all right, so uh, this table looks really complicated. Let's focus on two things. Um, uh, the top line called independent analyses uh, there. Um, this is the line, remember we said in our criteria for good within study comparisons, the analysts have to be uh, blind to the results from the other study. Um, this is the blinded uh, analysis here. Uh, the effect uh, and standard error for the randomized experiment and the regression discontinuity design are listed there along with the difference between them, uh, the standardized effect size, uh, and a t-test of the difference between uh, those two. Remember I talked a little bit about what criteria do you use for telling whether you're getting the same answer out of these two studies. Um, criteria tend to be, um, are the effects in the same direction? Yes. Are they of the same order of magnitude? Yes. Are they both significant or both not significant? Yes. Uh, and uh, if you can do a test that um, statistically tells whether they are significantly different from each other, um, that's also a good thing too. Um, I mentioned that we're still playing around with uh, those criteria, by the way. The two things we're playing around with are instead of using traditional significance testing, um, using Bayesian uh, analysis. Uh, and also then looking at equivalence testing rather than significance testing. And the answer there is that you're getting the same answer out of the regression discontinuity design and the randomized experiment when two independent analysts um, both look at the data. After that, what you see is a host of exploratory analyses that um, uh, show you the results from parametric semi-parametric and non-parametric regressions with and without a MAP pretest interaction covariate. Uh, the reason for that covariate will be obvious on the next slide. Um, in this next slide, the results for vocabulary. Uh, well, it turned out that um, in you learn a little bit, not just about non-randomized experiments, but about this entire within-study comparison paradigm when you do these kinds of studies. In that, um, in, in the forearm study paradigm that we're using, one, we're now doing another one of these studies and we're doing it a little differently. We are, uh, before randomly assigning people to be in a randomized and non-randomized study, we are uh, blocking them or stratifying them on pertinent covariates. Uh, why is that important? Because in this example, it turns out that the people in the non-randomized experiment and the regression, uh, the people in the randomized experiment and the regression discontinuity design um, had significantly different math pretest scores. And that's a bad thing. It means that your gold standard randomized experiment may not be a gold standard anymore because it's got slightly different people. Um, and that was um, uh, the purpose of adding that math pretest interaction covariate. Uh, you'll notice on the right hand side in the pink. Um, uh, highlight uh, some of the differences in the analysis that were not blind. Um, again, the analysis at the top was blind, um, were significant, but when you adjusted for that math pretest um, uh, difference, uh, they were not significant anymore. Um, example seven adding a pretest to the regression discontinuity design. Um, the ordinary regression discontinuity design has three key weaknesses. It's got lower power than a randomized experiment. It is more dependent on statistical modeling assumptions, um, especially that assumption uh, that you are accurately capturing the functional form of the relationship between assignment and outcome. Um, and, um, and third, the treatment effect estimates you get out of a regression discontinuity design are most um, reliable, you might say, or valid um, at that narrow area around the cutoff. Um, because that's where people are most similar to each other. They're not identical, but they're most similar. 
Um, and the notion behind this study was that it might be the case that adding a pretest to the regression discontinuity design might help mitigate some of these problems. Uh, now, when I say pretest, I'm not just talking about adding a covariate, the pretest as a covariate in a regression equation. I'm talking about treating it as if it were an, another comparison group entirely. <clears throat> so let me give you some details. Um, this started with a randomized experiment, the cash and counseling demonstration and evaluation. Uh, the treatment, this has to do with, uh, I think, Medicare uh, uh, payments that are given um, to recipients. And um, the recipient makes the spending decision versus treatment as usual. And the outcome is dollars spent for services. Fortunately, we had uh, pretest, or this study had pretest data on dollars spent for services uh, from the year before the study and treatment were implemented. So you had an independent pretest at that time. So uh, Cody Wing and Tom Cook created a within study comparison by comparing the randomized experiment results to a regression discontinuity design that was created from the randomized experiment by deleting cases above or below a hypothetical cutoff on age. And this mimics uh, the regression discontinuity design. And then they examined how the addition of the pretest to that regression discontinuity design might affect bias and error. And here are the results. There, uh, I, I like to copy graphs and things, but there just wasn't a graph or a table in this one that really did a nice job of summarizing the results simply. Um, so I'll convey them narratively here. Um, the pretest, uh, I'll refer to them as uh, the post-test only RDD. That's the usual regression discontinuity design. And then the pretest RDD is the usual regression discontinuity design plus the pretest. So the pretest RDD produced estimates that were more precise, smaller standard errors than the post-test only RDD. That's a good thing because remember, power is a problem uh, in the ordinary post-test only RDD. All three of the methods, post-test RDD, pretest RDD, and randomized experiment, they all resulted in similar estimates at the cutoff. Um, uh, remember, you want, when you're doing these comparisons, to estimate the same causal quantity, in this case, both at the cutoff. Um, and the big benefit turned out to be the pretest RDD produced causal effect estimates beyond the cutoff that were very similar to the estimates from the randomized experiment. Remember, that's really um, useful because the, a limitation of RDD is that you get the, the best uh, causal estimate right at the cutoff. Uh, and that's not a limitation of a, re, of a randomized experiment. Adding the pretest to the RDD seemed to help reduce that problem. So summary for regression discontinuity design. Um, uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of work out there uh, that I have not summarized here uh, that supports the conclusion that you can use a regression discontinuity design. And if you properly analyze it, you can be pretty confident you're going to get the same answer that you would have gotten out of a randomized experiment. Um, but it requires more complex analyses. Um, and you probably want to do sensitivity analyses um, varying the analytic method to see how the conclusion uh, might or might not change as a result of that. And that adding a pretest uh, really improved efficiency and extrapolation at uh, points away from the cutoff. Uh, last, interrupted time series analysis. Uh, this is an area that hasn't received virtually any work until very, very recently. So there are fewer examples. And part of the reason is it's a little bit more difficult to do. Uh, 
uh, for example, consider that forearm paradigm uh, that I talked about uh, in example one and in example six, um, where you randomly assign students to come in and be in this study. Well, how are you going to attract students to come back in, say, 15 times over the semester without attrition? It's really, really hard to do that kind of study. But here are uh, two examples of within-study comparisons that are recent. They're not published. We're working on that right now. Um, first one uh, is one that I did. Uh, I happened to run into a randomized crossover design and realized that it could be used to test um, uh, as a within-study comparison to test uh, for uh, whether uh, interrupted time series can give you a good answer. Uh, I'll show you the uh, graph of this in a moment, but conceptually, um, uh, high dose versus the two treatments were high dose versus low dose immunoglobulin. Um, and uh, I'm a quantitative person, not a physician, so I can't pronounce hypogamma globulinemia um, and chronic lung disease. Um, there were 12 patients in a randomized crossover design. Uh, after a baseline that we will just ignore. Group A received high dose for six sessions and then was crossed over to low dose, and group B was the opposite, and the outcome was serum IgG levels. Here's the graph. Um, uh, you can see group A at the top, high dose first and then low dose, group B at the bottom, low dose first and then high dose. And we analyzed this two different ways. Um, uh, the first way to analyze it is to analyze group B only, ignoring group A entirely. And, and again, remember, uh, in all of these, both analysts are blind to the results from the other analysis. Um, in group B, uh, we treated it as if it were six short interrupted time series. Uh, and the mean difference between conditions, uh, 495. Um, or you can analyze the time six data uh, only, ignoring all the rest of the time points, um, as if it were an ordinary randomized experiment comparing group A to group B. After all, time six is their post-test had they not gone on to be crossed over. Um, and this was modeled in wind bugs with a logistic curve. Uh, and the mean difference was 511, just about the same. Uh, as uh, from the interrupted time series uh, design. Um, this is a different study here, example nine, uh, an interrupted time series with a non-equivalent control group added to it. Uh, the randomized experiment here was Indiana's uh, diagnostic assessment intervention. We saw that in one of the earlier examples. Well, it happens that they also had six pretest measures uh, and a post-test measure. Um, and so we created the within-study comparison by substituting uh, Indiana schools that were not in the randomized trial uh, for the randomized control group. And then you can analyze these data with and without pretest matching on the non-equivalent schools and systematically varying the number of pretest time points. Uh, the results, um, uh, the uh, comparative interrupted time series designs, the one with the control group, with and without matching, both well approximated the randomized results. And they both did so equally well. Um, adding time points provides an advantage um, uh, so long as you model the trend correctly. Um, uh, so knowing whether it's linear, nonlinear, et cetera, this is very similar to the issue with the regression discontinuity design where you want to model that functional form correctly. It's exactly the same issue here. Uh, if you don't model that functional form correctly, um, then having more time points can actually increase bias. Fortunately, we're making a lot of progress uh, on understanding how to model trends correctly, particularly with those semi-parametric regression methods. So a summary for interrupted time series. Uh, I think the evidence is much more preliminary here. 
Um, it is encouraging in that at least these two studies suggest you can get an accurate effect estimate uh, uh, when both analysts are blind. Uh, but we really do need to know a lot more about the conditions under which uh, this is true. Uh, it seems quite obvious at this point, for example, that correct modeling of nonlinearities is absolutely crucial here. Um, one of the things we're looking into doing to try to create a within-study comparison uh, is to go into the um, uh, jobs, uh, job training area where a lot of randomized experiments are being done. But they tend to be done with outcome measures that are taken from archives. And archives are ideal sources for time series data. Uh, and uh, if that's the case, we should be able to construct a time series um, uh, on the same people uh, that the randomized experiment uh, is done on, and then compare the results uh, from the randomized experiment to the results you would have gotten from the time series. So an overall summary here. Uh, I think empirical studies like these, and um, these are just some of the empirical studies that are out there. These are the ones from our research group, but there are plenty of other studies out there. Um, they're helping us now to understand the conditions under which good quasi-experiments can approximate randomized experiments. Um, and the results are at least somewhat encouraging here. Uh, the regression discontinuity design seems to be a sure thing. Um, uh, if you do good uh, uh, modeling of the functional form, uh, you're almost always going to get the same answer out of the regression discontinuity design as you would out of a randomized experiment. Um, for non-equivalent control group designs, we're beginning to understand it in theory, especially this notion of um, uh, modeling the select, studying and modeling the selection process accurately. Um, and then developing measures of that prospectively uh, in your well-designed non-equivalent control group design study. Um, but in practice, we do have a lot of work to do to understand um, selection processes a whole lot better than we do because nobody studies them. Uh, and then by comparison, interrupted time series is really in its infancy. Um, uh, things are promising, uh, but we don't have a lot of data yet. Um, but the good news is that we are learning more uh, on this stuff every year. And that constitutes the end of my talk. You'll note uh, a whole bunch of co-authors uh, and collaborators on these projects, and I acknowledge my support uh, from both uh, uh, the Institute for Education Sciences in the Department of Education and also the University of California has given me grants on this. So thank you. Can't hear you, David, interestingly. I can't hear you. I can see your mouth. Are, are, we, are we on now? Yeah, now you're we'll, on. Yes, okay. So thank you very much for your, for your remarks. Uh, I found them quite interesting. Uh, and I thought I would open the, the, the questioning uh, with some questions that occurred to me as I was thinking about your talk this morning and then, and then also as I was listening to it today. And, and listening to it just reaffirmed uh, some of the questions that I had considered in advance. So uh, I would agree with you that the, the evidence for regression discontinuity design seems strongest of the three that you dealt with. Uh, and the evidence on the interrupted time series probably seems the weakest. Um, uh, you know, a, a question for the investigator who's uh, sitting in his office or her office thinking about a grant application uh, and thinking about what kind of design should I propose, the question's going to be, um, what can I defend? What, uh, uh, what can I persuade the reviewers to accept? And how, how can we know in advance uh, whether the conditions that um, can support uh, one of these designs are actually going to hold in practice in the study that we're planning. I, I think your answer is going to be non the uh, regression discontinuity may be pretty easy to satisfy, uh, non-equivalent control uh, a bit more of a challenge, but, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. So we've got an investigator who's thinking about a study, doesn't really want to use a, a clinical trial, and uh, uh, you know what do they have to be able to do in that application to, to sell the, the quasi-experimental approach. Uh, 
Yeah, I think that's a really good a really good question. Um, uh, and you know, just to reiterate, in case anybody has any doubts at all, if you can do a randomized experiment, by all means, do a randomized experiment, unless you have some great reason not to do it. Um, uh, so I try to address my work a little bit to uh, the case where there's good reason for not doing a randomized experiment. Um, uh, I think the, the, you're exactly right that the key question is, uh, do we know ahead of time what the conditions are uh, for getting a good answer? And I think you pretty much answered it correctly um, uh, already. With the regression discontinuity design, I didn't go over everything in detail because I had so much to say. Um, uh, but there are a couple of things uh, that one has to anticipate there. Um, one of them is, uh, Will assignment adhere to the cutoff? Now, this is a conceptually exactly the same issue as in a randomized experiment. Um, if I toss a coin and it comes up heads, I've got to adhere to that uh, and uh, assign that person to the appropriate condition for heads. Uh, if I don't do that, if I have partial treatment implementation, treatment crossovers, et cetera, that's a problem for the randomized experiment. Well, the same thing is true for the regression discontinuity design. Uh, if you propose a regression discontinuity design, one of the things you want to think about is how certain am I uh, that treatment will be assigned according to the cutoff? Uh, if you're pretty certain of that, then you're meeting a key assumption. Um, uh, and then the second thing is a, a real simple one. Are you willing to learn some of these complex statistics or hire somebody uh, who uh, learns them uh, so you can do the data analysis uh, uh, properly? Um, uh, I also think that this notion uh, that was in probably around study seven uh, or example seven in my talk of adding a pretest uh, and I'll add as a corollary to that, maybe even adding a non-equivalent comparison group to the regression discontinuity design, I have a feeling is going to uh, end up being very important to that design for the reasons that example seven showed. All right, for uh, the non-equivalent control group design, um, one wants to be very, very careful on, on this. Um, uh, it used to be our least favorite uh, design. Um, I'm, I'm slightly more optimistic about it. Advice, uh, primary advice there is uh, study the selection process. Um, don't just use whatever data happened to be available in an arc um, somewhere. Uh, there is, uh, I, I have a publication came out last year, I think, um, with an example that was published in the American Statistician uh, showing that propensity score analysis does, did not work um, compared to a randomized experiment. Uh, and um, the problem with that study was really technically excellent, but the authors themselves said, there are some key variables that are not in this archive. Uh, and the example that they gave, this was a, a job training study, uh, and the example that they gave was, we have no measures at all of the motivation to work. Well, motivation to work is actually a key predictor of whether somebody enters a job training program. Um, so if you are not gonna be gathering your own data, you're gonna be using archival data, you still wanna study the selection process to understand whether the archive has the data in it that are um, the predictors uh, of selection. And then I think the, the second advice uh, that you can anticipate ahead of time is this notion of what we call a focal local control or a hybrid selection model uh, where you are uh, trying to get controls from the same location with the same characteristics. But if you can't do that um, on all of your cases, um, than um, getting ones from different location. Uh, if you look back at 
uh, say the one of the references I showed you was uh, Cook, Shaddish, and Wong, 2008. That's in Journal of um, Policy Analysis, uh, JPOM. I can't remember exactly what that stands for. Um, and um, and in that study, we also looked at uh, non-equivalent control group designs that use controls that were not focal and not local. And they didn't even come close to getting the right answer. Um, so careful selection of the control group is uh, important. Um, but it's important just for reducing the amount of bias on the front end that the statistical analysis has to adjust on the back end. For time series, as you said, we know very little. Uh, right now, uh, uh, I think the issues would be uh, two. Um, uh, very similar to the regression discontinuity one, uh, good statistical modeling of trend over time is absolutely crucial. Uh, and uh, then I also think that adding a non-equivalent comparison group is going to prove empirically to be important. So that's more of the Thank you. Um, uh, very helpful and, and um, uh, clear. Um, I bump into people often who look at quasi-experimental approaches as an alternative to randomized trials when they're thinking they have a choice. They can they can choose to do a randomized experiment, and they're afraid it's going to be it's going to take a long time. It's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to be big, or they can do do a quasi-experiment, and it'll be smaller, less expensive, shorter. Um, uh, and uh, yeah. from your remarks earlier, it, it sounds as though you would advise them if they have the choice to go towards the randomized study. And I, but I don't want to answer that question for you. What What are your thoughts yeah. there? Yeah, I would. You know, it, it's a really interesting question on the cost issue. Um, uh, it's It's not, to the best of my knowledge, been widely studied. There's a few studies of it, um, but. The few studies that have been done um, don't study the costs of non-randomized experiments that are well done in the way that I uh, described in my talk. I think if you do a non-randomized study using archival data where you don't pay any attention to whether the variables uh, model the selection process well, um, uh, then it's probably going to be a lot cheaper uh, than a randomized experiment. Um, but I think the thing I've not seen studied is uh, what happens if you do a good non-randomized experiment? What happens if you do that pilot study to select, uh, uh, to identify the uh, selection process and do all those key informant issues, uh, interviews and things like that? I wouldn't be surprised if the costs on that would add up. Um, now, whether they would reach the cost of a randomized experiment, it's unknown right now. But I think um, a good non-randomized experiment could be pretty expensive. Uh, now, the exception to that is when you're working with archival data. Uh, economists have gravitated to the regression discontinuity design because it turns out in the real world there's an awful lot of uh, assignments to treatment that are done based on a cutoff on some known assignment variable. And that's in archival data. Uh, and um, in those cases, it probably is cheaper to do a regression discontinuity design on the archival data, maybe even a lot cheaper, especially if the archival data has um, a huge sample size so that you can compensate for that power uh, problem. I saw you were about to ask a question. I, I was about to ask about the power, power question, and, and you just answered it. So. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Anticipate. Um, how much uh, is the power increment? Uh, uh, there are some estimates that suggest that you need to have two times as many people in the regression discontinuity design as in the randomized experiment uh, in order to get the same power, all things being equal. Okay. Uh, there's a, um, a quasi-experimental approach that you didn't comment on today, and, and I don't know if it's uh, one that you uh, aren't fond of or simply haven't studied yet, uh, but, but you didn't speak to it, so let me ask about it, because I see it proposed on a regular basis, uh, often called a multiple baseline design. Uh, 
where yeah. um, perhaps we have a community level intervention. Um, someone introduces it in uh, one community selected at random out of uh, four. Uh, after a period of time, uh, they introduce it in the next, after a period of time in the next, and so forth. By the end of the day, they've introduced it in all four. And uh, they're looking for the same pattern of effect uh, over time in all four instances of introducing the, the uh, intervention. There's no real statistical uh, analysis. Uh, it's really, uh, boy, that effect is, uh, the pattern is strikingly similar in all sites, and so we judge that there's an effect. Uh, could you comment on, on, on that approach? Um, I'd love to because that's exactly one of the things I'm studying right now. Um, I'm not quite studying it at the community level. I'm, I'm actually studying at a very different level. In medicine, it tends to be referred to as the N of one trial. Um, in education and psychology, they're often referred to as single case designs. But the principles are generic um, uh, because they're all short interrupted time series. Um, multiple baseline designs are among the most common uh, of those. Uh, in fact, they are the most common of those. Uh, and um, yes, there actually are data analyses for those. That's what I'm working on um, uh, right now. Uh, I think that um, we, well, uh, let me, the options tend to be multi-level models or semi-parametric regression because you do need to model trend uh, very accurately. Uh, in order to get a good uh, effect estimate. Um, but within that context, it's very easy to analyze uh, those data. Um, we're just starting to look at whether multiple baseline designs give you the same answer as a randomized experiment. Uh, so it's, uh, I don't have an answer on that, but we are studying it. Right. Well, I'll be very interested to see how that uh, work progresses. Um, uh, one of the concerns that I've always had with multiple baseline designs, and, and the reason that I suggested that analysis was particularly problematic, is that if I've got four communities and I introduce this effect uh, over time in the four, uh, at any one point I've just got four communities. And so my degrees of freedom are very limited, power is very limited, yeah. uh, for, right. for what I would think of as a, as a valid analysis based on the number of communities rather than the number of observations. But it, it sounds like there may be some methods that, that uh, could be used. Yeah, I mean, a lot depends on, on exactly how small your sample size is. If you really only have four communities and you only have, say, two pre-tests and two post-tests, there's not a lot you're going to be able to do with that. Um, I'm working in cases where um, the average number of cases is three um, and the average number of time points is 20. Um, within that context of 3 and 20, preliminary results suggest we do have enough power. Okay. Uh, could you give us some um, uh, uh, insights into uh, uh, other work that's going on now, the, the new stuff that's coming um, in terms of uh, your work or others' work on comparing quasi-experimental methods and experimental methods? What can we anticipate over the next couple of years is as the, the new developments. Uh, you just identified one. You're working on these N of 1 studies. But are, are there other things that are out there that are, that are underway? Um, actually, I, uh, you know, I'm sure there are, but I don't know what they are. Uh, I wish I had a better answer for you there. Uh, uh, to prepare for this talk, I actually did go out and uh, try to find uh, all the stuff that my research group was doing. Uh, uh, and uh, you've seen most of it uh, uh, here. Um, I don't know that I can think of any kind of new approaches uh, uh, that are coming out um, other than the N of 1 stuff that I'm working on myself. But I'm sure it's out there. Uh, uh, what about uh, the general question of uh, persuading uh, reviewers? Um, when, I, when I talk to audiences about... Uh, uh, different kinds of research designs and approaches uh, in grant applications, you know, one of the comments that I hear often is that, well, reviewers are very conservative. They only want to see clinical trials. It's very hard to persuade them to uh, be open to or accepting of uh, newer methods or very different methods. Uh, 
Um, can you uh, tell us about uh, experiences that you've had or, or that you're aware of that others have had or offer advice uh, to somebody who, who really is in a situation where they need to use something like regression discontinuity uh, and they're concerned that the reviewers uh, may not be open to it? Yeah. I think that, um, and you know, here I'll speak from my experience as a reviewer myself. Um, uh, I don't, I don't submit substantive grant proposals myself because um, uh, I don't do that sort of thing. Um, but as a reviewer, if somebody's first thing I look at is somebody's going to propose a non-randomized experiment. Um, I want to hear the reasons why they can't do a randomized experiment. Um, so that's number one. If they can't convince me that they can't do a randomized experiment, um, then I'm not going to be enthusiastic. Um, but I think with the regression discontinuity design in particular, um, uh, sometimes opportunities present themselves uh, with date like archival data sets where it's clear that a cutoff was used. Uh, and you've got reasonably complete data on both the people who got the treatment and didn't get the treatment. And sure, maybe a randomized experiment might have been more powerful had you done it. But here you've got the data set in your hand. Um, we have a pretty good handle on how you can get a good outcome estimate from it. Um, I'd make that case. I'd say, you know, a bird in the hand here. And then I would be reviewing the literature that shows that you can get a good estimate out of a regression discontinuity design. Um, with the remainder of them, uh, I, I think the issue is, it's, you know, if I'm going to propose a non-randomized experiment, uh, or if I'm going to review a grant proposal with a non-randomized experiment, I really do want to see a good argument why they cannot do uh, a randomized experiment. Um, I'm not sure if that's answering your question or not, David. No, uh, it is. That has always been my uh, position as well when I've been on, on the, the panels reviewing. Uh, that first point is why, why not randomize? And if they're making a choice and they're, and they're doing it because they think it's easier and cheaper and faster, but they're proposing a poorly designed quasi-experimental approach, as you suggested, that, that's problematic. I, I think we're exactly on the same page. Do we have uh, points from um, our uh, web audience that we want to offer? Did we come through on Twitter? Nothing on our end. The, um, uh, we've, the numbers that we're uh, looking at in terms of audience will are up in the, in the hundreds range. Hundreds range. Uh, but we're not, uh, we haven't gotten questions through that. This was one of the questions that we had in our own little, not very tightly designed experiment today. How was it going to work getting questions through this webinar-only basis? Um, and um, um, as we're all seeing, uh, those questions have not been rolling in, uh, even though we have a good number of people online and participating in the, in the, uh, uh, in the meeting and watching and listening. So I hope that they have enjoyed the questions that you and I have been discussing. <laughs> it is always good to talk to you, David. <laughs> And it's always good to talk to you, Will. Do you have any other points that you'd like to offer to our audience before we wrap up today? Um, I think only one thing, and that would be uh, if you're doing uh, randomized experiments or non-randomized experiments, keep your eye out for opportunities to do these within study comparisons. Uh, if we're going to build an empirically-based theory of quasi-experimentation, we need a lot more studies of the kind that I covered today. Mm -hmm. I, I would support that. I would echo that. Well, thank you my, very much, Dr. Will Shaddish from uh, William Shaddish from the University of California at Merced, uh, for a very interesting uh, discussion today on uh, comparisons of quasi-experimental and uh, experimental designs and the strengths and weaknesses thereof. Um, if we have no further uh, points to raise here, then uh, we will thank everyone for their participation and uh, close out the seminar. Thank you, Dr. Shadish. Thank you. Right, thank, thank you. you. I've enjoyed it. Bye-bye.